the uh, redevelopment agency's meeting for today, December 11th. Um, first, we will take any general comments from the public. I don't have any, so unless anyone wants to. Kirk. <laughs> you, sir. Hi, Kirk. Good, good afternoon. So you have two minutes, please, Thank to you. address us. Hi. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, I wanted to come and just uh, address the board and thank you for uh, the collaboration between the Redevelopment Agency and Preservation Utah. Uh, I should say I'm executive director of the nonprofit Preservation Utah, and we've had a tremendous partnership for the last five years. Um, and I'm happy to report that uh, our latest project, the uh, Preservation at Work Project House and Arctic Court behind the Marmalade Library, is. Um, uh, past the point of being on the market, we actually have a closing date uh, for next week. So um, we consider the project now a success um, and concluded, but I wanted to come and thank the board members for their vision and support of this project. I wanted to thank the staff. Um, they've been tremendous. Uh, I think we have such a great relationship with uh, Danny and Susan um, and uh, Amanda. Uh, everybody really chipped in from the staff as well. We had a great opening event in October that the mayor attended as well. I wanted to thank the mayor and the mayor's staff uh, for their support for this project as well. And I'm, I'm pleased to report that you know the, the person buying the house uh, is a first time homeowner uh, and is a brewmaster. Uh, which I think shows some of the diversity and some of the uh, types of people we want to attract through different housing types uh, and, and property values. So um, I do appreciate your support and hope we continu can continue that in the future. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else that would like to have has any general comments for the board this afternoon? In that case, uh, we will move on to public hearings, which we don't have any. And so the first item of business is approval of our minutes. Oh, yes. One more. Got it. Okay. We'll wait. We had to wait on those two, so we're happy to. <laughs> <laughs> oh. My name is Raymond Duno, and uh, as all of you are aware, I cannot hear. and. Uh, it's very difficult for me to really convey all the things that I want to say, and what you say I can't hear, so I'm sorry. But uh, we appreciate the support that you've given us, and you know this has been a long, long struggle for the Japanese community, as all of you know. And I think I'm probably one of the few living survivors that has gone through the total uh, change as far as uh, Japantown is concerned. And it's always been a struggle, as you know. And everything that has been done has always been a negative. And we've lived with that, and we try to make the most of uh, you know, what has happened. And the thing that I think I'd like to really stress is we're not obstructionists. We really want to see Salt Lake City grow. But we want to grow with Salt Lake City. And every time we try to do something, it uh, works negatively toward the Japanese community. But it's been a long history and the project has had, you know, its uh, negative impacts. But it, in spite of all those negative impacts, you know, we've made some progress. And I think that one thing that I really appreciate is finally the city has recognized that there is a problem. And, you know, you have been trying to help us and we really appreciate that. And you know, for those that are no, no longer here that used to work with me on this project, I hope that, you know, from up above, they are looking down and saying thanks to you for all the things that you've done. And the, the group of people that I'm talking before now are all younger, and the, my peer group, you know, I have less peer pressure because they're all gone. But, you know, you folks have been really, really uh, helpful in terms of recognizing what uh, the problem is in trying to help us. So anything that you could do that would be positive for us would be helpful. But the thing that I want to really express is that we really want to grow with Salt Lake City, but we want to have a Japan town that grows with it. And we have a little sliver there, as you are, are you know, are aware. It's and time. <laughs> well, you know, Sorry. whatever we could do to make that 
uh, uh, more positive, you know, for the Japanese community. And whatever we can do as a community, we really want to support whatever you do because we want to grow with Salt Lake City and we want to be part of it. But we used to be a pretty, de you know, decent part of it, but no, that no longer is the story. So uh, everything you, that you can do to help us, we would appreciate it. Thank you so much, Judge Uno. We really appreciate your words. Is there anybody else who would like to say anything then? Then we'll now move on to business. So uh, first we're look, looking for approval of minutes from our board meeting on Tuesday, December 4th. I move approval. Second. I have a motion by Board Member Mendenhall and a second by Board Member Johnston. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Then the uh, minutes are approved. We're next going to item number two, which is our RDA audit review. And if I can have uh, Mary Beth Thompson and Paul Skeen join us if we need, please. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to let you guys take it away. Um, so we have completed the RDA financial audit um, with one small, tiny finding. Um, this audit was completed um, a lot sooner than last year. Um, we have worked very diligently with Ide Bailey to move up our timelines, not only for this audit, but all audits, airport, public utilities, RDA, library, and also the city financials. Um, we work hand in hand very well together, but I'll turn this over to Paul and he can explain the audit. My name is Mike Mickelson. Uh, that's okay. Sorry. <laughs> Paul's the engagement partner over the CAFR and the airport and some of the other pieces. I do the RDA and I'll be back with the single audit results and the state compliance results later. Uh, but as I said, I'm the engagement partner for the redevelopment agency audit. Uh, I'm not sure what the finding is you're referring to because this year we don't have any findings. We have in the past though, so excited to, to be here to say that. But uh, first of all, when we, uh, we've been here before and so I, and we've described what we do in an audit, so I'm not going to go through all of that except to remind you that there are some inherent limitations in what we do. We uh, are required under auditing standards to establish a materiality threshold for our audit procedures. And so we're required then to plan our audit to detect any misstatement, whether it's fraud or error, above that threshold. But there may be misstatements below that threshold that we don't find and that we don't detect. The other thing is we can't look at 100% of the transactions. Uh, you've spent a year accumulating those and you don't want us to be here for a year going through them. Uh, so we have to do things on a sample basis, not a test basis. And so that, again, is another limitation to what we do. But the areas that are more material and that we believe have higher risk have larger samples, and we do more test work there than areas that have less risk or a, a lower materiality. So then we design our audit procedures, and we perform those and do our work and gather our audit evidence to determine our auditor's opinion. And this year, we are issuing, again, an unmodified opinion, which is a... Uh, I hate to say clean, but that's what people are used to hearing. It's a clean opinion. It's the opinion that states that the financial statements are fairly presented in all material respects in relation to generally accepted accounting principles. So uh, the report was unmodified. Uh, that's all on page one. Page two has a couple of uh, additional items, other matters that aren't modifications of the auditor's report. So they're not in any way decreasing the, the clean opinion or anything. But there is some additional information that the Governmental Accounting Standards Board requires with governmental financial statements. And that's called required supplementary information. And that deals with the uh, uh, management's discussion and analysis that uh, precede the financial statements. And it deals with a couple of schedules that are behind the footnotes that are specific to uh, the pensions and some pension disclosures. For that information, we do some limited procedures, but we do not provide any assurance on the required supplementary information. So the paragraph at the top of page two just lets financial statement readers know that we are not opining on that RSI. 
Then at the very back, there are some uh, schedules by project area. That is not required uh, by anybody. Uh, formally required, I should say. There's no statute. There's no uh, other type of requirement. That's a management desire to include that, and maybe the board's uh, desire to see that too. So that's uh, not required supplementary information, but that's other information. We do some limited procedures on that. Uh, we tie it out to the financial statement information that we've audited, the financial statements themselves, any other audit documentation that we gathered to make sure that those schedules uh, are, f are uh, we say that they're fairly stated in relation to the financial statements taken as a whole. So we offer an in relation opinion on those statements. And so the last paragraph of our auditor's report just describes that. So uh, the financial statements themselves should be fairly consistent with what you've seen through the course of the year. Uh, I think maybe the format that you get is not uh, necessarily the same format because you don't have to look at it on a gap format. Uh, there's no requirement to do that during the course of the year, so you probably get in a format that makes uh, sense to you and in, in your decision making. Uh, there were just a number of very small entries that were provided to us by management uh, right after we received the trial balance that are not audit entries, but they're uh, immaterial uh, in terms of our materiality threshold, so we don't believe that they would change a user's judgment. Uh, they were posted, like I said, they were management reconciling items, but they're the only small differences between what you've seen during the course of the year and these financial statements. Mr. Michelson, if we can um, interrupt right now, Board Member Mendenhall had a, a comment, question. Yeah, Mike, I have a question on, um, it's one of the more simple uh, revenue statements, but it's on page six of your report. It's the net position table. And I wondered if you could just explain to me what the deferred inflow of resources describes. That isn't a term I recall our budget articulating. Page six, you said? Yes. Okay, so that's the summarized net position. That's part of management's discussion and analysis. So that's, uh, there will be a more detailed version of that on page 10 and 11. Uh, but your question applies to both of those statements, so it doesn't okay. really matter which one we look at. So a number of years ago, I want to say th just before uh, you were required to uh, record that uh, pension liability under uh, generally accepted accounting principles, there was another standard that came out that created these items called deferred inflows and outflows. So there are items that don't technically meet the definition of an asset or a liability. There isn't necessarily a future benefit related to that. The deferral is related to the recognition on the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in net position. So the items they have here, I believe, are just related to the pensions. And that makes sense with pension. Yeah. Uh, yeah, pensions on both of them. So those are items that will be recognized as potentially expenses in a subsequent period. Um, one of the best examples is you're on a June year end and Utah Retirement Systems is on a December year end. So you've made contributions from January 1st through June 30th that Utah Retirement System hasn't accounted for in the liability as of December 31st, which is what they provided that you've recorded. So that will become an expense after Utah Retirement accounts for it in their following year, because you have that six month lag between the two years, and so it's, that's one of the things that's recorded as a deferred outflow until it's recognized in the subsequent period. Thank I you. hope that makes sense. It does, absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so behind the financial statements themselves are a number of footnotes. Those are disclosure items that just, uh, offer some descriptions of things that you can't necessarily do in the tabular uh, qualitative format of the financial statements. Describes, there should be some description of those deferred inflows and outflows there. Uh, other accounting policies uh, are described there as well. And then additional information such as capital assets and long-term debt that might be more summarized in the financial statements. There's more detailed information. And there's a really long footnote on the pensions if you're interested in that. Uh, so that is our uh, report on the audit is that it's an unmodified report. We have issued another letter that's required to be issued when there's a governing body such as this one. Uh, 
Um, it's fairly boilerplate. It talks about our responsibilities, uh, the plans, scope, and timing of the audit that we did in accordance with kind of what we've communicated uh, previously through the engagement letter. Uh, there's one item I want to address there. The accounting, or the financial statements, rather, they're made up of a number of estimates. Uh, not everything is uh, something that you can account for exactly. Uh, we're required to disclose to you what we think the most significant estimates in the financial statements are. and we. In our opinion, that is the pension liability. Uh, we've talked about that before, but it's an actuarially determined liability that's determined by an entity outside of the city. It's done by Utah Retirement Systems. They hire third-party actuaries. Uh, they have their own internal actuaries, and they make a number of assumptions in uh, determining what that liability is. And so that number then is provided to all the governments in the state uh, their share of it, and so that's recorded. Then the city, once it gets its piece, allocates that out to the different funds and the different component units and things, and so there's been an allocation of the city's share of that liability to the redevelopment agency. And so because of the nature of the actuarial calculation and then the subsequent allocation in the city, that's, that's an estimate, and we feel that's one of the more subjective estimates in the financial statements based on the actuarial assumptions I'll go into that. So, uh, other than that, I'm happy to say that there weren't findings this year. Uh, the, the issues we've had in the past years with the, the material audit adjustments with some stability in the accounting department now uh, did not come up this year, and so we're not reporting any findings for the redevelopment agency. Any more questions I can answer? Board members? If there is no discussion on this, thank you so much for the audit. I know you guys were working really hard to get it done earlier. We talked about that in staff meeting yesterday. But um, in that case, if there is no further discussion, I'd be looking for a motion to accept the audit and direct the staff to distribute it as necessary. Second. I have a motion by Board Member Luke and a second by Board Member Mendenhall. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? we go. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. You too. Thank you, Mike. Let's see. Next on the agenda, it, we have budget amendment number two. If we can get Ben and Danny, please, and Jennifer's here. You can stay here. <laughs> <laughs> I can give a brief intro, Madam Chair. That'd be great. Thanks, Ben. Earlier this year in RDA budget amendment number one, the board approved $7 million for a potential property acquisition. In the intervening months, the discussions and negotiations were not successful to pursue the opportunity. In response, the board initiated the current budget amendment before you, budget amendment number two, to pull back the funds instead of leaving them sitting in an appropriated account when the opportunity no longer appears likely. The board held a public hearing on November 27th, the meeting last month, and there are several options for the $7 million in the staff note, and I'll review those quickly. The $7 million was pulled from 11 separate project areas and agency funds, and you could choose you could choose to return them back to those contributing accounts on a proportional basis. A second option is you could put the $7 million in an unappropriated holding account pending future discussions and recommendations from the administration on how to use the funds. You could also choose to appropriate the $7 million to the revolving loan fund. And as was discussed previously, uh, some board members have mentioned the idea of seed funding for the new project areas of State Street and the Nine Line as being a potential use for some or all of the funding. And this is not an exhaustive list. I'm sure there are other options, but those are the ones that came to staff's attention. Danny, do you have anything to add on that? I do not. Is there any discussion here? Okay. Yes, please. Danny, would you just opine for 30 seconds? Just openly? <laughs> <laughs> I think you've heard me mention in past board meeting that yes. um, I, I'd li I like the option. I think Councilmember Rogers and I believe Johnston, we've talked about the advantages in the past of having seed capital money up front when we start a project area versus 
more of a traditional route of waiting right. for that tax increment to accrue and hoping that a catalytic project happens. Um, so with relation to the two new project areas and perhaps some opportunities along North Temple for catalytic project, can you opine on the yeah. opportunity we might have to do, maybe not all seven million as seed money, right. although there's some threshold of usability, I understand. I think there's definitely a benefit in terms of having funds available as these project areas get finalized. And, and by finalized, I think it's important to note that while the RDA board and the city council have approved the plan, we have yet to enter into any of the interlocal agreements with the other taxing entities. And I think that's important to note because there is still the potential for changes or at least understanding of what that project area uh, is going to be as we finalize those agreements. And so understand that this is still a work in progress that we're not fully, we haven't fully approved these project areas yet in terms of collecting increment and having that authority. So having said that, I think it is very important uh, very beneficial to have funds available to start spending within those project areas once everything is finalized and and to your point potentially identifying projects that we would like to start either getting underway immediately or at least start having funds available um, to that extent what I have said or what my opinion would be is that usually the best way to do that traditionally have been to have our revolving loan funds available and so if you've heard me mention before in terms of this seven million or even with regard to the seed money that loans are something that we can go in and do right away and start having that immediate impact whereas other projects if you're looking at a catalytic project you're probably going to have some kind of either planning or identification process that is not going to require you to have funds available immediately as much as you're going to have the ability to set aside those funds over a matter of a budget year or two. So my opinion would obviously be with the seven million to have it available within that revolving loan fund because one, we have projects right now that are in demand for those funds and two, that allows us also to have that opportunity for seed funds and start going in and doing projects and, and there's nothing ever stopping the board from if we do find a project that requires a reallocation out of that revolving loan fund, we can certainly do that at that time. I appreciate that. I think my, uh, to reflect on quickly on what you said that the placement of the funds into the revolving loan fund doesn't necessarily specify that those probable and hopeful to new project areas would become the recipients of some or any of that money necessarily. Right. There's a lot of development happening in the city and we do have 11 areas that um, yeah. we pulled the money from. Uh, and so I, I guess I'm interested in having conversation with staff and with the rest of the board about um, what some of those catalytic projects could be in hopes of the soon passage of our other taxing entities approval of those project areas also north temple catalytic conversation that's one that we've had several times i know there's some work happening on a specific potential project but that revolving loan fund pot of money could be some of that um, source of funding also i also think that by if we didn't put it into the revolving loan fund but we did a more specific dedication of some piece of it to the two new project areas although they aren't completed that that shows a, a, a nice degree of investment by this RDA to our fellow taxing entities um, that might may be encouraging for them to get this work completed but so I guess if I'll, I'll make a motion when you're ready for me to make a motion Okay, well, I think there's some discussion there and, and, and some things that just that I've learned, Board Member Mendenhall, that, you know, and Jen and I were talking about this, sort of best practices would probably be that people come with a proposal for this and we have some time to actually dedicate towards those discussions, which isn't necessarily what um, we had scheduled for today. Um, of course, we can put it back in the revolving loan fund or an, in an unappropriated account where we can then have another budget amendment once we have some ideas and some proposals to move this forward. So I'm gonna, and Jen had some more information on that. Just, just from a perspective of um, ensuring that we get the um, sort of public transparency aspect um, box checked that um, we include any proposals and have a public hearing about it and 
um, consider it that way. So um, the board could absolutely take action today legally, but um, just in, because there's not an urgent um, funding request, um, just taking that opportunity to try and um, have that regular process. I would just add that at the October 9th RDA meeting, uh, RDA chair uh, Kitchen had requested RDA staff look into a short list of potential projects that would be good Kickstarters to catalyze tax increment generation in the two new project areas. And I'm not sure what the timing is on that request, but it was previously made by the board. And that's good to remember. Again, I think if we come with proposals and ideas of, like this, we can certainly reopen this up and talk about it. But it, I agree with Jen about the public transparency on these projects and making sure that since there isn't an urgent need that we can move forward in sort of the way we typically move forward and making sure the public's involved in, in this. Uh, so may I ask when we might hear back from staff from that October request? Yeah, we are looking at including that as part of um, a budget amendment that we're bringing as far as uh, probably now including this seven million as well as our fund balance and cash balances that we would bring overall as a, a large gathering of the RDA funds that are in our account and then at that time present these proposals and projects that, that we would request that we allocate funds to. So I'm sorry, were you, is that um, that path assuming that this money would be in the revolving loan fund? Um, that, that would have been one of my recommendations as part of that. And so I think what we're saying is that would be part of that discussion. And we can list the projects and proposals as part of that. And I'll just add, depending on what the board's action is, I think that would inform what the um, administration would propose for the next budget amendment. So, yeah. you know. Any further discussion? Board Member Luke. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to Board Member Mendenhall's uh, point, I do think that you know this is a substantial amount of money that um, we don't often have available for catalytic projects. So I'd be, I'm somewhat hesitant just to put it back into the revolving loan fund, where um, you know it would. I'm not saying that it wouldn't be, you know, used properly, but I think that there are more things that we could do to. Um, spur uh, redevelopment in some of our project areas and so um, you know I'm more on the side at this point of, of, of moving that to the unappropriated holding account so that we can then um, vet any of these you know any applications or different catalytic project ideas that come forward um, and not have it kind of accidentally dispersed through um, to some of the smaller, you know, uh, projects through the revolving loan fund. Cool. Board Member Johnston, sorry. Madam Chair, would you like me to make a motion after Board Member Johnston? I didn't say that Board Member Johnston was going to talk, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here. Um, you're talking about transparency. Regardless of where we put the money, though, your transparency is in the process of specific project funding, not in where we put the money right now, okay? Um, just to be clear, because I think we're unclear about, right now we're looking at where do we allocate this money fund in our accounting, essentially. Um, if we put it into an unspecified account, it doesn't limit us, but it doesn't necessarily make it easy for you to figure out how do you, what does that change for you, I guess, from an accounting perspective or, or planning perspective for projects? Really all this action does for us today is it's it's really more of taking it out of the allocated account that it sits in right now, which mm -hmm. was for the purpose of property acquisition. Mm -hmm. And so by putting it in an unallocated account, it simply just defers the decision of how we allocate that money in the future. And, and what the board is basically stating is at this point, we want that to be a conversation that puts proposals on the table and has a, con a discussion of where our priorities and how we want to spend it. So really doesn't do anything to affect us today uh, directly, as long as we, we can come back and have that conversation. Um, well, I would say we have loans that are in uh, that are requesting funds right now that we may or may not necessarily have. I don't think we have any deadlines at this point that this would prevent us from from meeting. Okay. And do we have a sense of uh, how imminent the MOUs um, with the other Texas entities are for the two new project areas? Um, we we've reached out to the school district. We've had initial conversations with the county. I mean, I would say those are probably still a couple months before we we have those negotiations and have an agreement back to you. To, to execute and approve.
Monica. So it just hits the pause button for a yes. minute. <laughs> I, if there's not any further discussion, anybody? Madam Chair, um, I move that we appropriate the $7 million to an unappropriated holding account, and I believe that Board Member Mendenhall has something she wanted to add to that. Uh, with the intention to evaluate potential catalytic projects with RDA staff at an upcoming date. That, is that a friendly amendment to your that motion? Is, that is a friendly amendment, or do you want to do it as legislative intent? Jen, uh, Jen has I've, a look on her I've face. I've got the look on my face because I don't know that we have done legislative intents as the RDA board. I don't think we have either. Um, Katie's shaking her head no. Um, I think. Are we prohibited? I, from? I think, right. I think any, probably any statement you make, I'm saying probably so that she can throw something at me if I'm not right. Okay. Uh, so any statement I, you make as part of a motion reflects your intent. So I think uh, we can probably just leave it at that. Okay. Second. Great. All right. I have a motion by uh, Board Member Luke, a second by Board Member Johnston. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okie doke. Our next um, matter is the joint resolution in support of Japantown placemaking. And um, before we, I don't think we're bringing anyone. Oh, well, Danny, Danny, you can stay there. Um, <laughs> Allison, if Allison wants to join us, and Corinne, if Corinne wants to join us, you don't have to, but. We like you up here. Allison, did you want to start us off? Uh, I or understood you that you might want to start I, it off. That we can do. Um, I just wanted to take a moment right now, board members, to talk about, um, and to our public, the, this resolution, and that this is just one element in our intent for, to preserve Japantown and the heritage that um, has come out of Japantown. And I think it's important, and the reason I'm taking this moment is to ensure that this isn't just simply lip service, um, but that we as a board have shown, I think, and, are conti and as a council, are continued to be committed to honoring and preserving Japantown and the Japanese culture and heritage that is so important to our city. Um, as everyone knows, we have already put $100,000 behind the visioning process. This process will help to articulate a shared vision for Japantown and lay some really concrete steps towards implementation at, of streetscaping and placemaking for Japantown. Furthermore, um, you know, we have a council legislative intent to ensure that Japantown appears in our city's master plan and this will allow future developers and future um, uh, governments to, to understand our interest and commitment in making sure that this community is protected and honored. Further, as everyone is aware, this, this came out of a project, Block 67, and um, we as a board will be looking at and considering a potential community reinvestment project area in on Block 67, and I think as we move forward with this resolution, with the commitment that we've all put forward to ensuring the, the protection of Japantown, this will be one of those ways that we can help that entire project move forward, hopefully in a really positive way, both for the city, of course, and for Japantown. And I want to reiterate what Judge Uno said when he was up here. I appreciate that um, our Japanese American community and we as a board in a city want to grow and work together. And I I know that this board, with all of the work that, that has been done to try to create a space for Japantown to be heard, that we will continue to be committed to that, that vision and making sure that we're all moving forward together in a really positive way. Um, of course, meanwhile, we, I encourage the RDA. I know that we're going to be looking um, for a motion, I think, later in this agenda, right? It, this one for the placemaking, the hundred thousand dollars for the placemaking to hire a consultant and move forward and really in in those concrete steps of what we need to do to um, for placemaking and streetscaping over on Japantown. So I encourage obviously that to move forward um, 
And I think if there's anything else a board member would like to say about this, Ms. Uh, board member Mendenhall. Oh, I, I was hoping that we could uh, pass the resolution right now. Are we set up to do that? Yes. Yeah, I'm not there yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there any other discussion? Allison, did you? Just a note of clarity. So as, as board member Mendenhall uh, and you already mentioned there is a there is a motion to pass this resolution now the motion having to do with the hundred thousand dollars for placemaking was actually already passed so so that one's done this is another step and there will be several other steps as as we go along tonight perfect um, is there any other discussion on this Corinne um, and we've set the first working group date for January 16th um, and we'll be at the Japanese Church of Christ building and um, we're looking forward to that and we'll be setting our objectives our goals our timeline um, and basically a you know consistent meeting date moving forward excellent thank you any other discussion on this oh, that's not board member Luke no <laughs> um, may I read the resolution as part of the motion to pass it sure. this is a resolution of the board of directors and executive director of the redevelopment agent agency of salt lake city supporting the establishment of a working group composed of block 67 stakeholders with the goal of working collaboratively to articulate a vision for japantown and participating in the study and implementation of streetscape improvements to enhance placemaking in the community whereas on july 12 2005 salt lake city and salt lake county adopted a joint resolution recognizing the unique cultural economic and social contributions of the japanese american community and the need to mitigate the impacts of the salt palace convention center which displaced japanese american businesses and cultural assets along 100 south between 200 and 300 west whereas on september 19 2006 the salt lake county council encouraged salt lake city to rename first south between second and third west as japantown street recognizing the historical importance of salt lake's J japanese community and its relationship to the development of the salt palace and that quote the actions of salt lake county in expanding the salt palace convention center have inextricably bound it to not only the future but also the preservation of that historical community end quote whereas on march 6 20 2007 the salt lake city council <laughs> changed the name of 100 south between second and third west on an honorary honorary basis to japantown street whereas the board and executive director of the redevelopment agency of salt lake city seek to ensure that future development is sensitive to and supportive of the unique cultural assets in the area as the rda considers significant reinvestment to spur additional large-scale commercial and economic development in the adjacent area and whereas on november 27th 2018 the RDA approved $100,000 to fund a study of the public right of way along 100 South between 2nd and 3rd West, which will evaluate, design, and estimate costs for potential streetscape improvements, including but not limited to pedestrian and safety enhancements, improvement to st facilitate street festivals, increased neighborhood connectivity, and options that reflect the cultural heritage and assets of Japantown. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the board of directors and executive director of the redevelopment agency of salt lake city that the rda hereby supports the establishment of a working group composed of block 67 stakeholders with the goal of working collaboratively to articulate a vision for japantown and participating in the study and implementation of streetscape improvements to enhance placemaking in the community be it further resolved that the board and executive director will evaluate specific ways to include this policy goal in future projects project area plans and objectives for the area. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And at this point, I think Council Member Luke. Uh, yes, I move that the board adopt a resolution of the board of directors and executive director of the redevelopment agency of Salt Lake City, supporting the establishment of a working group comp composed of block 67 stakeholders with the goal of working collaboratively to articulate a vision for Japantown and participating in the study and implementation of streetscape improvements to enhance placemaking in the community. All right, I have a motion by uh, board member Luke, a second by board member Johnston. Is there any other discussion on this? Again, I just want to say thank you to the RDA staff. Thank you to our Japanese American community. This really has been one of 
my greatest moments of being able to sit in these meetings and watch how we're working together really to make this city amazing for everyone who lives here. So I, and, and the hard work that you guys have done to make this happen is unique and I, I commend you for taking this on and for doing this for our communities. So with that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. All right, with that, we are on to um, item number five, which is our affordable housing coordination follow-up. So if we can get Tammy and Danny, and is Melissa Jensen here? We're a little early. Oh, we are a bit early. We can have a dance party in the meantime if anyone wants, no? Okay. Maybe give a little context what our goal is. Okay. Um, as per my sidekick suggestion, which you always listen to Jen Bruno, by the way, um, we, uh, just to give a little context of why we're here, we came here last month to talk about the, um, our housing coordination between HAND and RDA. And Tammy had made an amazing table from last month that kind of put together the different roles and responsibilities both of HAND and RDA as it relates to housing and our housing stock. Um, we had a brief discussion last month about this. This is sort of follow-up. I think there were some questions that board members had um, at that time, although yesterday we couldn't remember what those were. Uh -huh. um, some of them related to uh, data about some of the recent um, investments in the last couple of years. Um, also some uh, questions about the guiding policies for some of the housing trust fund um, loan programs specifically, because there's um, sort of just the general guidance, the general policy guidance provided by Grow SLC, but not the specific sort of um, program by program targeted um, as, as in the RDA. So I think when uh, we were talking yesterday, we thought it would be helpful, um, and the RDA staff had indicated that they would take a proposal to RAC um, next month to help inform um, what originated this whole thing, which is a housing uh, funding um, policy. I'm probably not phrasing it the right way. <laughs> it's, so going forward, something to frame how the board would fund housing through the RDA tax increment. So um, with the anticipation that RDA staff is going to take that to rack next month, um, what kinds of feedback and input does the board want, specifically want rack to consider now that you've had this information provided to you from HAND and the RDA? Are there um, key elements of the plans that you know, you want to see expanded, or are there key elements you want to see addressed or stayed away from? So, anyway. Great. Thank you, Jen. And then, hi, Melissa. Welcome. We were a little early. I apologize. Don't. We were early. Um, so, with that, I don't know if, Tammy, you want to, to start us off, and then we'll go from there. Sure. I think you teed it up perfectly, but just to reiterate, um, we will be returning with a draft housing funding policy, and we're also working on a transmittal um, on the RDA side that outlines uh, funding expenditures over the last five years, so you'll have that information. So that's forthcoming. And um, briefly, Madam Chair, I could just touch on high-level information that we discussed last time. Is that okay with that would members? help? Great. So last time we discussed um, the differences in the roles between HAND and the RDA and kind of our different focus areas. HAND focuses on a wide gamut of housing activities ranging from policy development to more programmatic, programmatic activities um, to administering federal funding to community partnership programs um, to providing gap financing through the Housing Trust Fund, and then also looking at city-owned surplus property for development, including affordable housing. So with that wide gamut, the RDA's um, focus area is much narrower, looking at specific real estate transactions um, in our city. We look at, um, specifically in project areas, how we can use housing development as a tool to further our goals in those areas. We look at um, housing activities to spur off additional tax growth and return on investment. 
Um, but we also are charged with looking at citywide housing goals and using RDA funds to address um, citywide needs. And also being under the umbrella of economic development, we want to make sure that we're looking at housing as a tool for economic development, recognizing that they're closely interrelated. We also discussed how um, even though the RDA's roles and responsibilities as compared to hand are, are different, there are areas where they inter intersect, which is primarily in the form of gap financing through the RDA loan program and the housing trust fund. But within those two programs, um, the programs do have very different goals and objectives. RDA, we don't just fund affordable housing projects, we fund market rate, commercial, all through the same pot of money. Um, we have specific underwriting standards. Um, the board may waive those standards. Um, through the, the uh, loan resolution, like for several of the affordable housing program or projects that have come before you recently, those have required waivers to our standard RDA loan policy. Whereas Housing Trust Fund um, doesn't have specific underwriting standards, there's much more flexibility in the loans they provide, um, usually cash flow loans, um, less return on investment than what the RDA is looking for. So those are kind of two areas where we overlap but still have kind of different goals and objectives. And then we also talked about areas where HAND and the RDA have been collaborating recently. That's through the disposition of land. Um, we'll work with each other on disposition objectives. We collaborate on each other's committees, where the, whether that's selection committees or development committees. And we also um, have Melissa, um, the director of HAND, sitting on the RDA finance committee. So there is quite a bit of coordination on projects and programs um, between the two departments. And then just briefly, if we reach all the way back to May, we talked about um, statutory requirements of the RDA and historical practices. So just a quick refresher. Um, the RDA, uh, each project area, it depends on the statute that was in place when the project area was adopted. That determines the percentage of funds that are required to be set aside for affordable housing. So that ranges from zero to 20%, depending on the project area. And by practice, the RDA, um, just by practice, even if it's there's no requirement in a project area. So for example, the Central Business District and West Temple Gateway don't have a requirement. We've set aside a minimum of 10% just by practice. So we're looking at formalizing that practice in the forthcoming policy. And then um, through 17C, um, we this affordable housing allocation that's required, we've also, by practice, um, basically divided it between citywide housing and project area housing. So half of it has been used to implement project area housing goals and half citywide housing goals. And of the citywide portion, a portion of that has gone to the housing trust fund. And that has varied year by year depending on just different priorities of the year. Jen? And if I could add, I think that it's, it's um, and Tammy mentioned it a few times, that it's by practice that the board um, and the RDA has done a number of things that are consistent with um, what the city's uh, desired investment is in housing. And so the goal was just to formalize that practice and policy and then kind of taking a look at when you're establishing a new policy, should we look at other ways to do it? And so um, I think that that's the process we're going through now. Great. Um, Discussion from board members? Board member Mendenhall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Tammy, I wanna go back to the, the part about different underwriting standards and that the Housing Trust Fund doesn't have underwriting standards, which allows the flexibility. But as I think back over, and I know that we're gonna get a list of loans, and I appreciate that, um, but as I look back over loans that we've done through RDA pro processes, that and as you talk about in here, um, the board has the authority to waive certain components of the underwriting that are set as the standard, but but for our ability to waive them, and um, ultimately that feels like the same degree of flexibility as having no standards, but without the oversight of this board um, or the council in our other role. And so I, I do feel um, discomfort in having no underwriting standards for the Housing Trust Fund. And I think that our history of working with RDA staff through our different RDA loan tools um, and other financing options to discuss where the gap is, 
where the pinch is on certain projects, how the public investment can come into play, and, and allowing this body to deliberate on those waivers in a public setting is my preferred route for legislative work. And so I would like us to explore, probably in our council capacity, um, and probably even a little bit today in our council meeting, we'll touch on it, but the, I, the perhaps the application of um, underwriting standards as they exist in other loan capacities in the city or, you know, work with hand to figure out um, what those might look like for the housing trust fund. And if I could just suggest, too, that um, we take the opportunity that this is going to be reviewed with the Redevelopment Advisory Committee, which has um, uh, citizens on it with expertise in housing and finance, um, that they could weigh in on what some of those underwriting standards might be and reasonable yeah. to be. And I think on, in addition to that, it would be really helpful for RAC to have access to the forthcoming um, loan history information so that they could compare um, and look at you know different scenario potential outcomes um, based on what we have approved historically through housing trust fund versus RDA processes they've gone through so my second question if I may madam chair is if I go down to attachment a with this really great graph that you've put together and I appreciate the work that's gone into this, I have to say I wish there was one more column, which was the- It wouldn't fit. <laughs> <laughs> which is an advisory capacity. So we have, I don't know, there's, they aren't, these rows aren't numbered, but what, there's probably 15 or 18 different tools listed under programs. Um, if there were a column for advisory roles, such as the Housing Trust Fund Advisory Board or RAC, which of these would, or if you can tell me which ones, or how many of these would not have an advisory role? Should we start with your first question? Well, I thought that was a statement. But. <laughs> well, um, just, uh, I have just a statement of clarification on your first question of statement. Course. One, uh, one of the reasons we developed RDA underwriting standards through the program was that the board also gave um, the RDA Finance Committee authority to approve loans at 500000 and below. Right. So that's one difference between the Housing Trust Fund and the RDA um, loan program. Just wanted to clarify that. And I think that's important to bring up in the RAC evaluation, so thank you. Yeah. And then as far as, I'll let Melissa answer for hand, but as far as RDA goes, we have the RDA Finance Committee looking at all of, all of our four, progr four, uh, four programs. Thank you. Okay. Melissa, would you mind, um, and, and you don't necessarily need to go line by line if you know which ones aren't sure. necessarily under an advisory role. Absolutely, so I think the Housing Trust Fund starting there, uh, that board has traditionally been used uh, to only oversee Housing Trust Fund loans that went out the door in terms of cash. So it's certainly an applicant driven uh, advisory board. Um, all of our federal programming, I would say, does not have an advisory capacity um, in terms of like our mortgage program and the community land trust. And, uh, you know, we have a, about a $50 million plus uh, mortgage portfolio. Um, so, I, Melissa, will you just, um, I'm, I see CDBG, when I go through source of funding next yeah. to those, mm -hmm. some of those, it looks like it, they come from multiple funding sources. Right. So what about if it's a, like, let's pick home repair program. Could an applicant receive both CDBG and program income fund? Uh, yes, but I would say that that's probably not traditionally how we use it, but I would like to get back to you on that. Sometimes it depends on the circumstances of the home, which funding stores. Home is infinitely more restrictive. And so if the um, homeowner, for example, can't afford the repairs that would be required by home standards and life safety issues need to be addressed, we might select to use CDBG as an example. And so it's really depending on the applicant needs um, how that funding source is determined for, for that specific program. So, in looking down the list, 
am I safe in assuming that the home repair program, that these, that the following programs do not have citizen advisory or other advisory oversight because they're federal dollars? The home repair program, Welcome Home, SLC, even though that has some program income fund? It's still a uh, program income from CDBG. Okay. So um, House 20 would be under Housing Trust Fund Advisory? So what's interesting about House 20 just historically is the initial investment for this program came through a forgivable basically grant from the Housing Trust Fund, so they reviewed it initially. Since then, it's been in um, homeless services funding and then recently was approved as part of the sales tax budget for housing. So, and, and as such, as part of sales tax, there isn't an advisory capacity. Correct. Okay. Currently, yes. So that seems like one where we have an opportunity to create an advisory capacity for local dollar expenditure on the House 20. Okay. Um, CDBG's fed. Home Development Fund is fed, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Community Land Trust is ours. And it was initially federally funded again and then in the sales tax, yes. So that's another opportunity for advisory capacity. Any others? Well, what I, I, I want to clarify just one point because, as you know, all of the federal funding is approved through the CDCIP board initially in terms of funding re recommendations and program overview um, for initial dissemination of those dollars. Um, and then what I would say is that disposition of city-owned property mm -hmm. um, follows the ordinance associated with that, and I can get you the exact ordinance number, uh, but no advisory capacity, um, although often we um, use what's called a design review committee, and I can talk about that later. Um, impact fee waiver we haven't really established yet I think we're still in the midst of sort of that policy discussion and then you have the additional sort of uh, continued federal grants and then all of the new programs at the bottom correct yeah which is I think it's to your point uh, board me board member Mendenhall um, about the opportunity there if there's a desire to do advisory capacity and what that would look like and the framework for decisions so to my peers I, I feel that um, as we've We've worked so hard as council and administration and RDA staff to open the doors to housing opportunities in the city, created new funds, be, and it have been creative about ways to incentivize this growth. Um, I think it's requisite that we have a conversation around making sure that there's the citizen advisory capacity of those professionals who don't work for the city, but whose job we um, we rely on with all of our RDA loan programs, and we rely on with the Housing Trust Fund, but we've identified you know, about 10 um, hand tools that are really important tools for making housing happen, but where there isn't um, outside expertise giving us advice on some of those loans. But this is... Um, Probably not an RDA action. No, but I welcome the conversation. I think we all do. Because one of the things I think we've talked about throughout at the last year that I've been here is what the role is between RDA and HAND. And it's something that we've, that sort of spurred all of this conversation is me, I think, being a pain sometimes of saying, what's the mission here and what's the mission here and how do they go together or not go together and are we reinventing the will in some places where we don't need to be reinventing the will and now I think that board member Mendenhall you're absolutely right not only have we opened up opportunities for housing but I think the RDA has gone through some pretty critical oversight over the last couple of years from my understanding um, and that it has created, I think, some some good policies for which we can move forward for our housing and our economic development in RDA areas. And I think we have a real opportunity now with our sales tax to say kind of almost the same questions and this the same 
I would say analysis perhaps of what happened with the RDA to do here so that we're really capitalizing as much and leveraging as much as possible those um, anticipated and hopeful new sales tax dollars to create affordable housing. And I think there's a real, a real opportunity right now to understand what these two different roles are and how we can move forward um, in the best possible way. And this may be one of those questions that, that does come up in a council meeting of what's the oversight, how can our citizens who do have experience in this help us help us really move forward with the sales tax dollars so we're getting the biggest bang for our buck with affordable housing, right? And I think to the point uh, that um, Tammy brought up, I mean, you're looking at creating a policy to take to rack regarding how RDA is going to fund certain housing policies, correct? But how does that change with the sales tax dollars? How are we looking forward at what those sales tax dollars are and how are these policies going to benefit both of these programs in the best possible way so that we're, again, and I don't mean to kick a dead horse, but like that we're really getting the bang for our buck that we need and deserve for our housing markets and for our development as a city, right? And so I welcome this conversation. I think we're going to continue having it a lot. Um, I guess my question at this point, unless there's some other discussion on this, is going back to Danny and Tammy, what do you need from us what input would be helpful from us as board members um, as you're creating and looking at the policy and not just creating, I'm sure, tweaking it to get it over to RAC. What, is there anything that we can can help with from our end? Um, I, speaking on behalf of Tammy, and I'll let Tammy add to it, but I think this conversation has been extremely helpful. Um, I think the direction and, and as we're working to pull together the history of our, our projects over the last few years and what those have looked like, incorporating that in our conversation with RAC in terms of have we seen something within those projects and what we've been asked to bring to the board in terms of waivers that we potentially want to incorporate either within our policy and or are there projects there that align higher with the, the priorities of what we see as the agency to where we want to make sure we have that funding allocation appropriately divided so um, this was this was done at the request of the board to bring this information so I think if there's any additional information that you'd like to have us see or have rack review as part of finalizing that policy and bringing a draft to you this is what we're asking is what what else can we bring to help that conversation and, and reach that decision for Madam Chair, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that's been discussed. I just would like to have some sort of balancing test to see if policy implications will delay some sort of funding process through programs or if it will actually speed it up. So some sort of idea that we can see from the, each department how that will affect their, their departments in funding. Yes, Ms. Jensen. May I please just add one component? Um, I think, too, it, it, if we um, really happy to go forward on these discussions, and, and we could certainly share with you a lot of the information that we use also to guide our federal programs in terms of you know home underwriting standards and CDBG and parameters there, uh, because they're quite robust, and that might be a good uh, launching point for sort of you know thinking about it holistically and how we move forward in the different funding sources. And then I did not mention, um, but wanted to, the Home Development Fund has an administrative review committee. Um, so it's, it's internal based, it's not citizen run, but that functions more, um, more similarly, not exact, I want to be clear, to um, the housing trust fund where you have sort of a review and an analysis. And a few years ago, um, the CDCIP board and the mayor and this council sort of, um, because those home dollars weren't being used in the community and they were kind of being held for years and years, um, we decided to make it for shovel ready projects and construction. And so um, I wanted to articulate that because I didn't do so. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, I anticipate that we will be having more of these conversations as we sort of move forward with the policies um, and I don't know if there's anything else anybody else wants to say or anything that any council member, excuse me, board member would ask from any of the people sitting at our table today. Any information that we can have them bring back? Okay, I think we've got it too. 
Just anticipate <laughs> lots of more questions. I'm sure of it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <clears throat> Danny, it's your show. <laughs> um, you, Melissa. Thank you, Tammy. Given that we just met a couple weeks ago, we don't have much to report other than um, just wanted to uh, bring the board up to speed and make you aware that um, we have been, we have regular meetings with the county in terms of the operations of Eccles, but we have been working with the county of reaching out to engage GSBS architects to help us start looking at different ways that we can uh, activate and further improvements we can make to McCarthy Plaza as part of the theater. And so I know there's been some discussion in the past on that that some of you may have been involved in, but just want to give you a heads up if you hear anything on that, that that is something that we're taking on of kind of trying to make sure that that plaza starts realizing the, the vision that it originally had that <clears throat> kind of has struggled as the theater has opened up in terms of theater has been very successful and as such the plaza serves very well as the loading dock that it's intended to but unfortunately a lot of the other activity has not come to fruition so that's a effort that we are undertaking right now and happy to provide any updates or or information on that to anyone at any time so or one other question on that that could happen in a, a future follow-up but I would um, and we raised it when we had um, some of the county management folks here just recently yeah for the budget report on the theater thanks Jennifer but about activation of the winter garden too which I think was part of the public benefit analysis when we when the theater was conceived and the lack of it being open to the public is something um, I've been asked about quite a bit okay. so if, if when you come back to us with the McCarthy results plaza results i would also appreciate the board learning about why that hasn't been activated and or accessible as it was intended to be and what steps could be taken and i'll just chime in just as a board member on the eccles um, theater board that um, we've put that request in um, for CFA staff to begin considering that now in the winter. They, they did make the point that in the winter months, the challenges are a little, you know, there's a little more challenges with cleaning and things like that, but that they were willing to look at it because they recognize it also as probably their, one of their weakest points. So we're gonna keep asking about it just as board members too. So I think that'll help. Okay, thanks. That's it. For Luke. Just to, to build on that, I mean, that, that was one of the primary um, things that, that we as not only an RDA board at the time, but as the council uh, were the most excited about. Um, the Eccles Theater is fantastic. Um, it's a great addition uh, to that downtown block, but it is, it is not accessible uh, to the public unless you are going to a show there. That was not uh, what we had discussed. Um, so I, I appreciate you raising that issue. Um, as a board member. Great. Anything else, Danny? That's it, unless there's any questions. Nope, and I don't think I have anything. Any questions on the written briefing that we received? Or discussion on that? Great, in that case, I will look for approval of our consent agenda. We have a motion by board member Wharton, a second by board member Luke, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okie doke. I think Thank you. we are done. Uh, what time are we starting our council meeting? Let's start at 3.30. Okay. So we'll meet back in 12 minutes. Great. Thanks, everyone.